Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Coaching Christy. This is Andrew Beluga Whale Simon with the lovely Christy Arnett. Hey. And uh, we are looking at uh, another video. This is a separate video than the one we looked at the first two weeks, uh, but still four tables of 25 cents, 50 cents. Um, and uh, how have things been going of late, Christy? Uh, not the best. Um, I know the last episode we talked about how I felt like I was running a little bit bad, getting good, and um, but I felt okay about it because it was going according to plan, you know. But then uh, I played this session um, and a couple other sessions, and I got played back at so much more, and I wasn't really prepared to to figure out how to how to attack that and. You know, I know in a previous episode we talked about the reason why I'm getting played back at. The most likely reason is that they're picking up hands because in this, in this, uh, at these stakes, you know, people are playing much more tighter, much more passively. So if they're playing back at me, they most likely have a hand. But I got played back at so much, and I, I started to lose track of exactly who was doing it, and I got a little frustrated, and where I veered off the path that we, the plan that we had, <laughs> it didn't turn out so well. <laughs> so, which is, which is more or less honestly to be expected. Um, it's, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, there's a session that we talked about, um, in the, in the, when we were initially doing our coaching, um, before we were videotaping this stuff, um, about a session that Tom Dwan played, um, on, on TV heads up against somebody who was like kind of a passive fish. And it, the passive fish just kept on getting hands, just kept on getting, you know, straights and flushes and full houses and all this stuff. And he kept on raising and Tom kept on folding. Mm -hmm. And what's the, the discipline inherent in beating small stakes um, or in beating any type of bad player is that when you have a read that we stay disciplined and confident in our read. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. I.e. if some guy who is limping every single time has never showed down a non-nut hand, check raises us three times – uh, you know, we still probably have to side with the fact that he probably has, you know, a nuttish hand, um, and isn't bluffing us very often because that's just not what he does. Mm -hmm. Now, if we see him at showdown, if we have conclusive evidence, um, that he might not be so passive, then we have to change our plan. But, um, I think we're going to see some things today where we get frustrated in dealing with, uh, with bad players playing back at us, which we need to differentiate that from dealing with good players playing back at us. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, we talked last time. We started to get into, you know, how do we how do we adjust our turn play? How do we start to deal with players who um, are good aggressive players, or at least you know, good for any given limit, good aggressive players? Um, and uh, and we need to really really know the difference between dealing with a good aggressive player playing back at us and a bad player playing back at us. Um, and so I think that we're going to find today. I haven't, I haven't seen this video yet, obviously, but uh, is we get played back at by bad by bad players, either bad, probably bad passive players, and uh, we um, we treat them as though they were aggressive because we're sick of getting played back at. Right. So why don't we roll a tape and see what happens? All right. Let's channel some Ninja Dolphin power right now. <laughs> it actually starts off pretty slow, and I'm not. Um, I recorded um, about an hour of play, and I'm not sure if it gets. If well, if you want, we can fast forward to, to where maybe a little bit further in the session to where things start happening if you want. Okay. Provide, provided that you can explain uh, the necessary history. Um, I'm not really sure where where it happens, I think. Let's see. Oh, flop of full house here, but... Probably not a lot of action, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Tough to get action there. Hopefully a king or a flush draw or something. Um, but I mean, your, your experience is not, is not like uncommon. In fact, I would even go so far as to say, is this is one of the things that really keeps people stuck at small stakes, which is the inability to differentiate between bad players running hot and people trying to push you around. Mm -hmm. And with very, 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 very few exceptions, people aren't so good at pushing you around that it's not worth just letting him do it. <laughs> right. You know what I mean, if you think about how much money you make from bluffing, you know, relative to your risk versus your value bets, 
you risk a lot, so you actually only make like you know a relatively like theoretical a smaller amount on your value on your bluffs than you do on your value bets, which sort of makes sense because uh, on your value bets you never lose, but on your bluffs like you lose sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and the the real truth is that it's not such a big deal to get bluffed off a of hand. It's a much 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 worse big deal to pay off with a worse hand. Mm -hmm. Um, now this only starts to change once you get to higher stakes where people bluff so often that like if you get bluffed off your hand all the time it becomes a big deal. <laughs> yeah. um, but at these stakes it's simply not going to be – even the most aggressive of players um, is unlikely to uh, to really, really bluff us enough. This actually reminds me a little bit of um, – we haven't really talked about this before, but I've talked about it in some videos in the past. Uh, I talk about this my, my responses to getting 3-bet. Um, and one of the most common mistakes is to like get really loose aggressive into somebody three betting you without like a great read. Okay. Um, and uh, and in general, the best response to somebody three betting you a lot is just to play really damn tight. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's honestly just probably the most profitable thing unless you have a great read that someone's really throwing you a lot they're you know really loose aggressive regular but what a lot of people make the mistake of doing is they get so afraid of being pushed around of losing their three big blinds <laughs> that they put in pre-flop um that they stack off with crap <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's what we thought we try to do with image we try to get other people to, to do that we try to basically represent um you know the same thing that happened which supposedly is going to happen to you this session um which is that you know everyone's playing back at me so much like uh spaz out <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and, uh, and you know that's that's what we want other people to do. Um, we talked about how image, the purpose of image. We might be able to raise that five three suited, by the way, for I to isolate, but it's not that big of a deal. Okay. Um, the purpose of image is basically to make good players turn into bad players. We can probably re raise more with the king king queen suited there. Okay. Um, but basically, it's to make good aggressive players start to act like bad aggressive players, and we all know that bad aggressive players are the greatest thing that we can play against. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we want to do is we want to you know be aware of ourselves when we start to turn ourselves into a bad aggressive player, you know? Yeah, I think that was definitely me earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I think that's Vulcan here on the top left. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's one of the players who starts to, to he, he'd already three bet me once. Um, but that was when I was raising out of the small blind. He was in the big blind, and a, mm -hmm. um, a player had limped the, the Tonituga, Tony Tuga or something. So um, I started to become aware of him, and he, I think, starts to give me a little bit of trouble. Can you but, pause uh, for a second? Sure. Perfect. Um, this king queen off on the bottom on the bottom table. I think mm -hmm. we should three bet that preflop. Okay. Uh, or excuse me, on the top right table. Um, Simply that uh, it reminds me of like we talked about many times before this idea of protecting our isolations, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, that this guy who's who's squeezing um, is sitting with ace jack. All right, let's give him ace jack as a hand. If we call here, he probably says, "Well, I'm going to squeeze with my ace jack, and if I have to stack off, I have to stack off," right? Mm -hmm. He's actually playing correctly given the way things are going on by doing that. If we re-raise our king-queen, a few things happen. Number one, he probably mucks his ace-jack, right? Mm -hmm. We can very clearly get value from probably at least one of these guys. Maybe not the guy directly on our right who looks like he might be um, some kind of a regular, but this guy under the gun, um, I don't know if we have a, a great read on him. And we, you know, most likely we'll be able to three back king-queen for value against these people. Um, but what's important is that in the, the, if you think about the way the same plays out differently, um, if we three bet and do what I call protecting our isolation, we are for sure going to play a pot in position. We are going to play a pot in position because we have the button, but we're for sure going to basically get um, a good chance to collect the dead money, and we're going to basically play with one of these guys and force the blinds out. Right? Mm -hmm. And the mere fact that we have king queen means it's relatively unlikely for one of our opponents in the blind to have a hand that they want to play against us. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's much better to squeeze them out and play with the guys that we're in position on than it is to call and let the guys try to take a squeeze on us. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, you can roll the tape now. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, so far, so far, we've already gotten three bet once by Vulcan, or no? That hasn't happened yet, or 
We have gotten through that one. Okay. Um, so, I mean, so, so far, we, we've opened now a few hands, one in the cutoff, one in the mid position, and he just really hasn't given us a lot of trouble, um, you know, in this orbit. Um, this kind of makes me think that, like, if this guy really was, you know, trying to play back at us, I don't think he would probably let us open two hands when he's in position on us, two hands in a row, and not, like, mm -hmm. do something. Unless he's getting total junk, but even like a good player with total junk will know will know to polarize against you, and will uh, and will you know th three bet one of those junk hands, something like that. So I, I'm still right now. I'm still thinking with this old Vulcan guy, um, you know, most likely, uh, um, you know, m most likely if he ra re raises me, he's probably got a good hand. Mm -hmm. um, bottom left table again, protection of isolation. We have a fish min raises and we're on the button. Three bet your ten eight suited there. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Get the fish heads up, force out the blind. The last thing you want is one of those guys to squeeze really big and put you in an awful spot. Um, what are we doing on the flop there? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I wasn't sure if he was um, just leading weak, so I thought I could just... We can, we can pause the tape for a second. Okay. Um, so... I should have just raised if I wanted to see if he was leading weak, right? Sure. Okay, so, so let's talk about, like... Uh, raising versus floating okay mm -hmm. um what benefit what so you decided to float there and mm -hmm. or full. Mm -hmm. um why i want you to argue, give me an argument why floating is better than raising there because um i don't really know <laughs> but I, I just thought he was super he, he's been just really passive and I thought that if he, if I raised there, then I would lose that raise rather than um, if he really didn't have a hand, he, I thought he would definitely check the turn. Right, but you do realize that, like, if you bet the turn, it's good, the bet there plus the call on the flop is going to be about the same size as the raise, right? Yeah, that's true. So in terms of your total, um, total money investment, it's about the same amount. Mm-hmm. The fact that he's passive should be an argument for you just to fold the flop. Okay. Right? Yeah. But even so, um, if you think someone has enough air, and someone oftentimes does have enough air on a king 9 3 board to get them to fold, um, you should just raise and, and just get them to fold like that because you don't really get any benefit from from floating other than letting him potentially catch another card he could bluff at or catch a card that could improve it. Okay. Right? But let's say this. I want to I adjust this now. Let's say instead of the board was king 9 3, let's say the board was queen 9 3. Mm -hmm. Right? Do you think that floating or raising is better there? Um, would floating be better because I have an immediate out to straight? Yeah. So now, like, if we raise and he re-raises us, that sucks because he probably has, like, a set of kings or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just blew a great chance to stack him. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so when we have a little bit of equity, it inclines us to call. We got like medium value equity. We really want to call. When we have like a ton of equity, now we're thinking about raising. We have no equity. We're thinking about folding. And what did we talk about before? If you're thinking about folding, then you can also think about raising. Oh, okay. The reason being that if we raise our 10-8 suited on the king nine three board and get re-raised, we don't care. Right. Okay. <laughs> we're not like, oh no, my 10 mm -hmm. high. I was gonna run all kinds of sick moves later. Like no, <laughs> we're like okay, like I 10 high, no big deal. Um, it's the same thing as if you're playing, if you're polarizing against a, a good player, you know, pre-flop three betting. If you three bet your ten deuce offsuit and he four bets you, you're not like heartbroken. You're, it's part of the plan. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that I think that a float with ten high with no real equity is probably not as good as a raise there. Okay, definitely makes sense. Cool. And we flop mad sets, so that's a good start. So much easier if you flop sets. Oh my god. <laughs> um, and so that hand should basically play itself. See, okay, so we, when you three bet the jack nine suited there, mm -hmm. that's for basically the same reason that I was saying we should three bet the king queen, that we should three bet the ten eight suited. It just seems like it's a little more obvious from the small blind. Mm -hmm. But one of the biggest reasons why we three bet there is to keep the other guy in the big blind out. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of other reasons we'll call it, you know, collection of dead money because the guy's got a wide range, going to fold a lot of his hands. We call it, you know, value because if he calls and folds the flop, that's good for us. Plus, we make good decisions later, blah, 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 blah. Um, see, like there with the, with the King 10 offshoot there, I would be really, really inclined to call there. 
Okay, because the one. Because we're on the button now, and it's a, it's almost certainly going to go huge multi-way. And if it goes multi-way, what happens? Who wins in a multi-way pot? Players in position. Exactly. Why is that? Because they can play perfectly, or more perfectly against the other players because they have glass. That's a that's a big part of it, but let's let's break down what that actually means. Um, when there's more players, what does that do to fold equity? It reduces it. Right. So if people can't, if there's less fold equity, people can't bluff as much. Mm -hmm. So if people can't bluff as much, what do they have to do? They either oh. value bet or they check fold. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, the guy in position just knows what everyone has. <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, if they bet, they're probably value betting, and if they're, you know, if they check, then they're probably folding. And so that means if it checks to you, you just take the pot. Mm -hmm. And if it bets to you, you look at your hand, see if you've got like you know a good hand, and if it's got a good hand, then that's good. <laughs> um, so, um, for that, uh, for sort of similar reasoning, we might actually go ahead and say that calling with the jack nine suited there is better than re than squeezing it. Yeah. Once we got there on this board, I would see bet because this board is still dry enough that we probably have enough enough fold equity to see bet. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's for the, like we have, we need to think about like who we're going to be playing against, um, if we decide that we're going to be three betting. And this spot, it's like relatively likely we go multi way, and we don't we're not really excited about being multi way, uh, in a three bet pot with not without a good hand, without a value betting hand. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that like, um, squeezing comes in many many shapes and sizes. Like, let's say, for example, that the button raises, the small blind calls, and we squeeze from the big blind. That's a much better spot for us to squeeze because we, we're never going to be totally out of position on everybody. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, like, under the gun raises, button calls, that's, like, a pretty bad time for us to squeeze without any time, without a hand that would be valued. Mm-hmm. You with me on that? Definitely. Definitely. Will make good sense? Yes. All right. Phenomenal. Um, Why is it so much easier when you explain it to me? Than <laughs> I don't know. It's like pretty simple. <laughs> I know it is simple, but what? I don't know. With poker, I feel like I've always been like that. When someone explains it to me and tells it to me, I get it. And you know, it might take me a bit to make it become secondhand nature or whatever to be able to look at it and do it myself. But I think that stuff like that is hard for me to just figure out by myself. Well, I mean, uh, the way that I figured it out was a lot of talking about it, a lot of thinking about it, uh, especially a lot of writing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone who's watching this is by far the most effective way to, to make um, to make yourself be good at stuff is to write about it. Mm -hmm. So if you're on an airplane doing nothing, like just start writing your thoughts down about poker mm -hmm. because um, nothing like connects your like thoughts in your mind like having something written down on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and so – uh, I mean, it it is difficult to uh, to figure all this stuff out. But the other thing that's really important is if you talk to people. One of the great things about having a coach, um, obviously, I've done coaching for a long time. I think that by far the best part about having a coach is the ability to have your you know it's ability to, to ask your coach and be like, hey, explain this. Challenge your coach to come up with like a good answer for your questions, because the process of that of basically the Socratic method, you know, questioning, you know, uh, like. Uh, you know, explain this to me, and then if they give you an explanation, like, well, what about that part? That you know, make sure their explanation is complete and satisfactory. And um, a lot of, I mean, I would say the biggest problem I've had with students is they don't do that enough to me. They just take whatever I say as the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the best the best students I've ever had are the ones who are like, Andrew, I think you're way wrong, and here's why. And every once in a while, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> I am way wrong, <laughs> and you're right. And so, it's learning is always going to be like that kind of um, uh, like a group process, mm -hmm. um, and so you might say, "Oh, it's so much easier when you explain it." But like, if you, if you come across something that you think that I might be wrong about, um, like you might be able to say, "Well, you know, I think that Jack Nine Street is still a good squeeze spot there because I, I'm not sure it goes multi-way that often, and there's a lot of dead money, and I'm still going to play great post flop, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. That might be able to buy it, mm -hmm. um, and and so. Uh, you know, as I tell all my students, if you can justify something, I'll buy it. If you can justify it, I'll buy it. Good fold on the flop, by the way, with Ace Jack. Um, that's a good. That's a good fold. Um, also, I want you to pause the tape. Pause the tape. Mm -hmm. 
This is something to notice, by the way. Um, uh, you actually scroll scroll back to that on the tape just a little bit to the hand that we had the ace jack hand that we folded. Um. Okay. Uh, yeah. Pause there. Okay. Um. So we bet this flop, and the guy to our left raises with king jack of clubs. Mm -hmm. What do you think about his raise here? Um. Well, he's basically saying that he's not folding. Um. And. Well, let's let's just say well, let's just say we know that he has king jack. Let, let's say we're playing in his spot right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the under the gun razor, he bets this flop in a, I think, a four way pot. I think there's another guy who folded before the action got back to you. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, what should he be thinking with a, with a big draw there? Um. Well, he doesn't. Well, do you mean like does he have fold equity? I yeah. mean, should does, he? Does he, have, does he have fold equity? What's his is his raise good? No. His raise is terrible. Everybody looks at their hand here and they say, oh my god, I got a gut shot to the nuts and I got a good flush draw. So I'm going to raise and get it all in. <laughs> Think right. about this for a second. You're C-betting on a ace, ten, nine, bo two-tone board in a four-way pot out of position. Mm -hmm. What does he think you have? <laughs> yeah. Or does he not care? He should care because, like, Ace Jack is towards the bottom of your range here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you had King Ten here, you might check fold. Four way out of position on everyone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so the fact that you're raising means that you alone have a hand you're probably unlikely to fold. And if you have a hand you're unlikely to fold, then he's best case scenario flipping with you. Mm -hmm. Right? Unless you have got like the seven eight of clubs, and even then you're still like okay. Um, so. Best case scenario, he's flipping with you, but then you say, go step one step further and say, there's two more guys behind him still to act on an ace ten nine board. Yeah. Reasonably likely, one of those guys pulled two pair better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so his raise here is really bad. What he should do, what's a much better plan for him, is to flat and see what happens. Not only does that not force you out and could induce a mistake on your end, i.e., let's say he, you bet this guy flats and then you know the short stack guy behind him actually ends up having it set raises, right? You might say, "Ooh, well, I pretty much got a jam here because um, you know because this guy's short, I've got top pairs, draw heavy board, blah 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 blah," right? Mm -hmm. So let's just sit, play this hand out differently from this guy. So if you bet your six dollars, he calls uh, W whatever that Y no ho. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever his name is, uh, uh, he makes a raise. You say, "Oh, he's only got you know." Uh, he looks like he actually has like, well, it looks like he's almost full stacked. But let's say that guy wasn't totally full stacked. Let's say he was like, I don't know, had had forty dollars or eighty big blinds, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say he makes a small raise. You might say, "Oh, it's only eighty big blinds, and I've got top pair good kicker, draw heavy board, blah blah blah." I'm all in. Now all of a sudden, amazing raise. The guy who does this raise here um, is getting uh, two to one on his money on his all in on the flop instead of one to one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's way better for him. <laughs> There's the the worst in this hand. The worst case scenario for him, once this other guy decides he wants to come along, is for you to to fold. Because you're drawing dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, can't win. It's always going to be between the set and the guy with the big draw. And so what he wants is for you to come along. His raise here does everything bad. <laughs> Everything that it doesn't want to do. Now, he, he might get lucky in the sense that, let's say the other two guys fold and it comes around to you. You might fold ace-jack here, right? Mm -hmm. To the raise. And that would, you know, that would be like, okay, you'd be playing maybe slightly incorrectly because if you knew his cards, you'd, you'd just go all in. But um, this is the bottom of your range. Against your range, what he's doing is bad. Because sometimes you're going to show up with a set here, a two pair, and a jam, and then it's going to be like, you know, you're a favorite against him. And he's pretty much setting himself up a spot where he's going to get heads up against somebody who's a, who's like a, either a, a slight favorite or a significant favorite against him. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. God forbid you have like ace king of clubs or ace x of clubs here, you know? Yeah. Like he's – it's such a clear call because of the table dynamics. But so many people get themselves in a spot where they, they don't evaluate their fold equity. They don't uh, – when he's raising here – sorry, I'm going on like a super long rant right now. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, 
when he raises here, he's like the the reason, the justification that he might have would be, oh, I'm going to collect dead money, right? Mm -hmm. I can maybe get some folds, and I'll collect from better hands, and I'll collect dead money. Dead money only exists if you have a hand that will fold to further action, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your hand is alive, right? If you have ace ten here, your hand is not dead. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you bet and he raises, you're going to go all in. So, um, in this sense, he's raising to collect dead money in a spot where there's very, very, very little dead money. Like, very little dead money. Okie doke. Glad we got that out of our way. We made it <laughs> fold. Um, <laughs> we can fly up the tape again. But it's just one of those things where I see people all the time, like, some fish raises and they shove their draw. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm collecting dead money against a passive guy who has the nuts every time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like there's no need to um, to try to collect dead money from a guy who's never folding. Because um, there's no dead money. Mm -hmm. I, guy's got to fold for the money to be dead. Otherwise, that money is alive. And uh, even though that guy, that guy, I mean, this is one of the great things how we can know. You know, people say, oh, well, how do you play poker against regulars? How can you win? It's because that guy's probably a regular. And he's just clearly doesn't have like a full understanding of how to play poker mm -hmm. you know that guy makes a lot of mistakes like that one is a reasonably large mistake and um and so you know we we can look at these little spots here like someone who does that or someone who doesn't understand like that's not that's a shows a poor understanding of table dynamics or somebody who has a poor understanding of leverage like raises too much um or somebody who uh, calls too light. I mean, there's a, a lot of things that uh, we can look at from like you know regulars and say, well, even though this person's a regular, they've got a lot of leaks, and this game is still really profitable. We have to, and we we should also learn from these things, by the way, by looking at this guy and saying, okay, um, this guy will, you know, for future reference, if we're playing against this uh, man, that guy's running really hot. <laughs> um, Actually, no, he, he sucked. Got yeah, sucked he lost, yeah. So, I was like to say, it's probably lost that stuff. Um, one thing to remember with this amazing race guy is that, um, you know, he's not so good that he's calling his big draws there. <laughs> you know, against some players who are very, very good, I might be able to fold a really strong hand like 10-9 to a raise on the flop there. Mm -hmm. You know, after C-bidding in a four in a four-way pot. Simply because, like, I know that guy knows not to raise his draws. Now, this guy clearly isn't that good. Um, and obviously, when you, we start to get into a little bit of a leveling thing there. Well, if he knows you're folding eight nine or not two pair, then he should, you know, be raising and you know to bluff and blah blah blah. But in general, people are going to assume they got no fold equity, or they should assume they got no fold equity, um, in a four way pot against the seabed or on a wet board. Just like kind of makes sense. Put yourself in the other guy's shoes for once. You know, if he's seabedding at you in a four way pot, what would you do in a four way pot? Call with the nuts. That's for shizzle. Probably split though, huh? Oh no, we're can't lose. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Um, that guy is so short, you could probably just put him in with the with the king four suited. You know what I mean? Um, You're getting wait. a pretty good price. Oh, okay. On the bottom left table. Oh, okay. He makes it a dollar. There's already another 75 cents in the pot. There's only four more dollars behind. If he ever folds, which would be crazy, but he might. And he may call us with some worse hands, like some two cards, like Jack-10 or something like that. Not to mention, we got a high card. We're suited. I think it's probably fine to, to re-raise and get it in mm -hmm. um, with that guy. But it would be like very, very towards the bottom of stuff that we do. But it's like we're getting, I mean, we're risking like $4, $5 to win $7 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um you know, that's pretty close to, to being okay. Okay. That math is probably way off. I can't wait for these episodes to air and for someone to be <laughs> uh, Andrew, you know nothing about math. <laughs> is it possible you also know nothing about poker? <laughs> and I'll be like, ugh. That is hard. <laughs> <Tough> questions. <laughs> um, another question I had was mm -hmm. small blind, big blind dynamics. You know, if uh, someone is always raising into your small blind, wouldn't it? When it folds around to you, um... We're raising into your big blind from the small blind, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, so if they're always doing that, then then you can just three bet with, like, a wider range for value, right? And then... Well, it depends on what they do. It depends on what they do. Okay. Um, to your three bet. You should, you should definitely three bet them soon. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? 
uh, just to see what their reaction is. Because if they call a three out of position, then we know what to do against that. We've got a plan for that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If they four bet us, we've got a plan for that too. Okay. Uh, if they keep on folding, well, we'll just keep on three betting them until we see what they do. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, like, against really good players, um, well, against sort of like, I would say, like, you know, good aggressive players sort of coming up through the limits, at least. Not like really like top level players, but like good, good aggressive players for each limit. I would say that it's kind of similar to the. Um, uh, to the hand we talked about before, in terms of like how uh, what our fold equity like should look like, um, I would I find that if we three bet uh, against a, a good aggressive player in the big blind against the small blind, we're pretty likely to get played back at really light, really fast, mm -hmm. um, because people are so afraid of being run over. <laughs> God forbid they just fold and sacrifice their you know half a big blind. <laughs> they they like like need to stack off with any ace because <laughs> because they don't want to get pushed around. So in this sense, like we actually should, um, if we if we see somebody starts four betting, we should take a basically have a plan of three bet five betting a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, which would be basically like, you know, ace king, ace queen, maybe even ace jack, any pair, um, and uh, and everything that's that we don't want to stack off with pre start flatting. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, that's if some that's if like a good a good aggressive player starts four betting us a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would guess, by the way, at these limits still, that the most likely response is people calling you. Mm -hmm. And if somebody raises and you three bet and they call out a position, it's really no different than if somebody raises in mid position and you three bet on the button. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just basically like we have a plan. It's going to be to three bet them with a non polarized range. It's going to be to value bet them post flop and not to bluff them. Mm -hmm. So we'll see bet. But we like one thing to remember is that table dynamics affects fold equity. So. You're going to get less folds in a blind versus blind post flop than you would normally. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's because people get all crazy in blind versus blind. It's really kind of dumb. Are you sure you're running bad this session? Because like so far it's like. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say I didn't say it was running bad. I, I said that at the near the middle to end, people start three betting me and four betting me a ton. Hmm. So. Um. Well. After after this is when I had a session where I was like, I had middle set against top set stuff like that. So, but it, it wasn't this one. Okay, well, um, we'll watch for another twenty five minutes or so, and uh, if we don't see anything, what did we just do? Oh, we just completed with the seven ten. Let's stop doing stuff like that, okay? Okay. <laughs> I've seen you do that a few times now. Okay. And uh, like the other day, we called the min raise with like king three off in the big blinds. Yeah. Like. Remember what we need to have a hand be playable. Okay. And also remember this. This is important too because we didn't talk about this yet. Um, we talked about this in our coaching sessions before. But um, remember, did I say when we're out of position we should devalue the strength of our hand a little or a lot, a lot, a lot? <laughs> a lot, a lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, this is actually something that people have a hard time dealing with because they say, oh, well, if my opponent's raising, you know, any two cards on the button, shouldn't I be calling with, you know, uh, king three off in the big blind because that's better than any two cards, right? And the answer is no. The answer is no because remember how we said before that like if it's a fifty-fifty equity wise, um, the guy in position wins, assuming that there's money behind. Mm -hmm. Um, it's you know it's the position is worth a fair amount of of theoretic equity. Um, so like for example, let's say that you're calling with a hand that's maybe. 60% against his range of 40%. He might still be a favorite there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To make money. Um, the last thing that's, that will make us distraught, and this is, by the way, down this bottom right is something to remember. This Poe Crespo guy is forbidding us, not calling. Mm -hmm. Now, it's likely he just picked up a hand. His, his forbid size was also probably too big, in my opinion. Um, so he probably doesn't understand leverage. So we may look to... Three bet, five bet this guy, which means to polarize, or to uh, and to start flatting more against him. But that's something to think about and remember right off the bat. Okay. What was I talking about a second ago? That was interesting. Um. You were. <laughs> I can't exactly remember where you were. You were like in the middle of a, a thought. <laughs> yeah. Um. It was. Oh, it was about. Um. It was about. Uh. Oh. Lame. I, forgot, I thought it was a little strong. I think it was about three betting and stuff, but 
Oh well. <laughs> For all of you out there wondering what what a coaching session with me is like, <laughs> I go on a lot of no, normally actually at the we do like about an hour long sort of like this a similar type of format. Although usually we do it with like live play, um, and uh, and then at the end we do like a half hour so that like all of these like trains of thoughts that I've like forgotten, we actually can tie them up with like a half hour of like review session at the end. Um, because we're doing an hour long video, we're not exactly doing that same format. Um, although the original intended uh, original videos that we screwed up uh, were in were in a similar format to that, but um, uh, unfortunately we we do occasionally <laughs> lose lose my train of thought. But <laughs> sorry, but I was we'll, like I was following there, and then I saw the the format. The Crespo hand, the format just threw me off. It's interesting. Yeah, I go on some tangents. It's usually reasonably organized. Um, one thing I should say, by the way, that I've noticed from your uh, from when somebody oh I remember what I was talking about. Um, when somebody like min raises you or you call with like weak bad hands out of the blinds, um, like oh we devalue our hand out of position a lot. Mm -hmm. um, see, I told you I'd find it. Um, all right, so what did we say we're never gonna do? <laughs> uh, call with call in three five pots out of position. Um, and what did we just do? Yeah, we just did that. I at the time I thought I had a good reason for it. Um. But, what like? <laughs> I want to hear what your good reason might have been. Um, well, I think I think your reason sounds like oh, I got two cards and they're really high. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's what I think if I had to guess that would be that would be the reason. Well, I yeah. At the time, I I was <laughs> thinking to myself that um, I've seen him three bet a lot, but I I I, I raised under the gun and he's not three betting me. Um, very. Wow. Ooh. Interesting. So, in the event that you actually had a good reason? Yeah. Well, um, I just I yeah. No, it wasn't it wasn't good enough though. I I know that. Well, um I just remember but, seeing him play like a little and I made a note on him that he was a little erratic, but still if he's if he is, then I should still be four betting, I feel. Well, there's so the benefit of four betting is this, is that this is actually really, really interesting to talk about, and uh, I think actually relatively cutting edge. So um, I might save it till the, the very end that we'll come back to this hand okay. and talk about it. Um, but uh, there is a time – we actually touched on this, I think, in one of the earlier episodes. There is a time to call three bets out of position. Um but we need to be aware of what that time looks like. And by the way, um, the time is is it's starting to become that we should do that against uh, good players. <laughs> okay. Um, not bad ones. Not bad there, ones. I I did remember you mentioning it, and for some reason I think that I talked myself into maybe this is one of those times, but I obviously completely misunderstood or or was just trying to find an excuse. No, a... actually, actually, I think what you what you did there was, um, at least the results prove that it was, um, is, like, the correct thing. But I don't think there's any sophisticated understanding of why it's the correct thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it should also be noted, by the way, that uh, that guy played his seven six suited like relatively close to perfectly on post flop. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, he played pretty well, which is, like, kind of a danger for us. Mm -hmm. But this is the, the sort of basic philosophy, I guess we'll dive into it a little bit now, um, is that even if someone's going to play well and they're in position, if their card advantage is so – if their card disadvantage is so significant, they won't be able to overcome it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the classic example would be this. If we knew that somebody was 3-betting the 7-deuce offsuit – and we had pocket aces, right? We definitely, definitely want to just call. Okay, so this queen 10 is really interesting because I think this is a perfect hand for us to experiment with, right? Mm -hmm. it, we could call with it, but it wouldn't be great. So we can three bet and see if he four bets us again or if he calls. Because if he calls, that probably inclines us to think that he's not a big four better. He just had a hand. Okay. But if he four bets us, that inclines to think that he is a big four better, and now we're gonna go full polarized. Okay. Um. But uh. 
but this hand is this hand is really 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 interesting because what we see there is that even though he plays his hand relatively well or pretty well post flop um he's at such an equity disadvantage by having a suited character into like two big cards that even though it's pretty hard for him to use his position and skill well enough to overcome the fact that you know we just have a much 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 better hand than him mm -hmm. um so like i was gonna say if we have aces someone three bet seven deuce we want to call with our aces because we're so unlikely to be outdrawn we have such an equity situation that even though that guy's in position against us uh we're much happier um letting him try to bluff us or letting him do whatever uh with our aces than re-raising them mm -hmm. so the moral of the story there is if somebody is three betting you with a polarized range and uh stack city hooray um yeah you're kind of crushing this session actually <laughs> um if somebody three bits you with a polarized range um one good response is to start calling out of position with really strong hands okay and four bet um maybe a little bit more uh more junk than good stuff um if somebody is, but see the the, the danger of that is as soon as somebody starts doing that, they can start three betting with a hand like, um, I don't know, king queen. And if we're calling out a position with pocket tens, we got a big problem, right? Mm -hmm. So you might actually say pocket tens might not be strong enough to call out a position, right? Okay. Um, but that you know, but then you might say, oh well, is pocket tens that much worse than ace queen? And you start to say, okay, well, somewhere in this tens through ace queen, we start to see hands that might not be strong enough to call out a position. Because the real question here is this: if you're going to call ace queen out of position, are you going to call ace king? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. But the truth is, is one of those hands where someone says, oh well, I would always four bet ace king, but ace queen is clearly a call. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Like, ace-queen and ace-king are just one hand apart on the scale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whatever we decide to do with ace-king, you know, doing it with ace-queen couldn't be that bad and vice versa. Um, and so, in this sense, you know, I, I don't, I'm not entirely, I, this is a theory that I totally I haven't totally thought out yet, mm -hmm. but it strikes me as, uh, as against somebody who's polarizing you that it would be better to call out a position with all of these types of hands. Um until you start getting deep you know what i mean mm -hmm. because the deeper that you are the more someone can actually use that skill position the less that their cards matter so let's say we're 300 big blinds deep there we got to format it okay you know what i'm saying yeah um because if we call there like it's we're in too bad of shape there if let's say um we can't check shove the turn <laughs> you know what i mean mm-hmm Let's say we got another 250 big blinds behind. We can't check shove ace queen there. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Definitely. So we flat, so we flat there. Tell me about the flat. Um, I, I, okay. So I kind of thought I could just experiment to see if because I I made a note on, who who because he was being, like kind of squeezy. So I thought maybe he might try to squeeze there, but I don't know. It's bad. I mean, with a really, really good read, it's not terrible. Um, but uh, I think that uh, we're probably better off just... It's one of those things where it's like, yes, yourself a question. Can I get value now? If the answer is yes, then do. If The only time you would ever not do that is if you thought, well, can I get better value later? And uh, in this case, I don't know if you get better value later. So I just get three bet on... Or, no, I Why don't you go ahead and pause the tape? I three bet on the top right and at the bottom left. And actually, I think I three bet on the top left also. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the top right Zach stuff four bet me and I have pocket sevens in the small blind. Um, okay, yeah, I saw that, and that's a fine spot to fold. Mm -hmm. Um, al although we we do like pairs equity getting it all in. Um, I just don't really feel comfortable with somebody four betting me. Um, with no real history against that player, mm -hmm. um, getting in any pair. You know what I mean? Especially not at these limits. Um, at, at some against really really aggressive players, then I would you know snap shove <laughs> any pair that I had. Um, one thing about pocket tens here is why. Let's start off by asking why are we three betting the pocket tens on the button? Um, for value. Okay. 
And that means that we expect him to call or raise with the worst hand, right? Yes. Um, so what did you think he was going to do? you think he was going to call you or think he was going to raise you with the worst hand? With a oh, call. So when he doesn't call, mm -hmm. um, what does that tell us about our plan for getting value? That I can't get value anymore. Yeah, that maybe we can't raise for we can't raise for value and expect him to call us with the worst hand. Mm -hmm. So then we got two options. We can either call preflop, mm -hmm. like call like the, the original raise preflop, or we can three bet it, hope that he raises us with the worst hand, and then five bet shove. Okay. Right. I'm gonna assume that what you did here was flat call. Yeah. Because it looks like that's what your mouse is about to do. Yeah. Um. Which is bad for us in the sense of it's, um, you might say, oh, well, we're able to, you, 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 I think your argument to this might be, which is actually kind of a good point that we bring up, oh, well, you always say if we're 50-50, the guy in position wins, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that implies that there is money behind, right? Mm -hmm. That we can actually do something with position. If we call this, there's no more action. <laughs> it's one guy goes all in, and the other guy either calls or folds. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's not as though, like, position is a huge factor um, once there's this much money in the pot, which is why that we, if we think we can shove, we shove, and if we can't, we fold. Um, and if we have to raise fold pocket tens, that means that we'll probably have a pretty bad plan against the guy we're playing against. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So... But how am I supposed to know when I can, when I should just be calling or raising for value against different players and, until sure. something like this happens, you know? Well, you can until something like this happens, which okay. is why it sucks to happen that it happens like this. Okay. But if I was in your shoes right now, I would fold my tens. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I would, and what I would do from there on out is I would take a hand, like we did on the bottom right table against this uh, Poe Crespo guy. I would take a hand like Queen-10 off, or the Jack-9 off, or the Ace-6 off, whatever, and I would 3 with this guy again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I would see what his response is. If he 4 bets me again, right, then all of a sudden I've got a new plan, which is I'm either going to call with my 10s or I'm going to 3-bet, 5-bet. Either one would probably be fine. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. um, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to 3-bet fold them because now we know this guy like actually has a range for 4-betting and can do this stuff light, etc. Um, but until I know, then i got to what, do what we said before, which is assume passivity. I'm gonna assume passivity until we're proven otherwise, and this hand alone isn't enough to prove that this guy doesn't have a big hand right now. Okay. Um, so why don't we play the tape and see what happens now. So we call because we're, we, our hand looks pretty and because we're not at all thinking about relative strength. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we oh we timed out and folded. Hooray! <laughs> we were going to call, but... <laughs> I wanted to, and then I just kept thinking, kept thinking about, about it, it and then just let it, it fold me. <laughs> good. That's good. I'm happy with this. Oh, wow. We're really getting played back. All right, now we get a cold format, and we've got Ace-10. This is one of those spots, by the way. I love this, this is happening right now because this shows us something really, really cool. So important that we don't when we're getting action from like everywhere, <laughs> yeah. that we don't like attribute all that to like one guy. You know yeah. I mean? Like we we we're getting four bed over on the top right by the guy on the you know on the on two seats on our right. Then we're getting four bed on the bottom left by the guy two seats on the right. Then all of a sudden we get four bed by the guy on the two seats to our left, to sh like to freak out and shove like our ace ten there, <laughs> is, is what we can't do because that guy had never done shit. Yeah. <laughs> that guy's just hanging out the whole time. And, that's and by what the way, I... that guy's not a bad guy to be because a lot of people will freak out and shove their ace ten. Yeah, yeah, and that's what that's what happened earlier, earlier today. <clears throat> Actually, I was playing a session and I kept getting three bet and four bet, and I, that is exactly what happened. I got a little frustrated and got kind of lost as to who was doing it. And I mean, this is it happens all the time. It's like. You you feel like everyone at the table is four betting you, and you have to remember that like the table is not like one entity. That's you're not, <laughs> like, you're not playing you versus the table. You're playing you versus like five individuals. Yeah. And so we see here is now what we start to see is is so so far now we I think we've been four bet by four different players. <laughs> yeah, I think okay. five. Maybe five different players. Yeah. Okay. 
unfortunately, <laughs> that doesn't tell us a lot about any of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It just kind of sucks. Um. So here on the bottom left, I think that's a little bit of what happened. I was, all of a sudden, I was gun shy, and. Yeah, you. I mean, you have to go through the process every time, which is, can I get value? Mm -hmm. And we actually play. We should probably check raise this flop for value, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Because I think that he will call it a lot of worse hands. Um, once the king comes, this is pretty interesting. Um, you go for a check. Um, that was my first inclination to go for a check because he, he clearly doesn't have a king. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we should go for a bet. Okay. Um, just because, like, the most likely scenario, if we're going to get any money at all, is that he has, like, a pair of some kind. And if we bet there, we really only rep, like, a few kings left in the deck and, like, and a bunch of flush draws. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, like what I said, what we said in our coaching sessions, if you're going to be unbalanced, if you're in a spot where you're unbalanced, it's good to be on the, the like value, the unbalanced side of it or like the value side of it. Mm -hmm. So we call it through in position with ace 10 off. Not terrible, but not amazing. Um, and why, why would we bet this flop? Um, because I thought I could get worse hands to call. Like what? Like, <laughs> like, actually, king well, ten, queen ten. Yeah, king maybe queen. ace king. Uh, king queen is gonna shove on you. Hmm. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's one of those spots where I'm not. I I'm not like really. Ooh, I would fold to the check raise because that guy is ne not bluffing you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is one of those spots where I can see the frustration in our game right now. Yeah. 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 I remember what I was saying before about how tilt works. It's honestly like an it's like an addiction. It's like we what makes us comfortable is by doing stuff by not thinking about stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> we didn't go through the process really at any point in this hand. Yeah. We're betting the flop for value from nothing. Mm -hmm. We're getting raised by a passive guy who three bet pre flop and then check min raised the flop and we're calling down with a pair of tens. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, the reason why this is happening, why we just abandoned everything that we've learned, is because of an emotional response to getting four bet by five different players. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one thing to get four bet five times by one guy, mm -hmm. right? That's a guy that we know how to deal with. But what, what we see here is so obviously a lot of players picking up hands against you at times when you're going for thin value. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And it sucks, but it's one of the things that we recognize about when we go for thin value, part of the plan is sometimes someone shows up a better hand than us. Right? Mm -hmm. The most important thing we can't do with these limits is pay off passive players. And like that calling up even betting the flop there is bad, but like even worse than it's not that bad relative to calling a race. <laughs> okay. You know I mean? Yeah. Um like, because if you're betting the flop there, it's because you're expecting him to call you with some worse hands, maybe. You know, maybe he calls you with ace-king or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We are not betting that flop, expecting to get raised by a lot, of, a lot of worse hands. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, it's... I don't mean to be harsh, Ninja Dolphin, because, like, I love how fast your game's improved. But we can still see that we lapse, you know, and we have to focus on, you know, the process is what matters, the process. Yeah, of course. No, I... I need the harshness. I need, because I was, and after the session, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, like, yeah, the top right and the top, or the bottom right. Uh, All right, so, so, uh, the, so pause the tape for a second. Okay. Um, so, the top left table, mm -hmm. we threw at a mid position raiser, he formats us really big. Mm hmm. Even though he's already done this once, you know, I'm pretty confident enough to say that he, given his size and position, this is still most likely a hand that crushes us equity-wise. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So I would be really inclined to muck that. If I was going to shove any of them, the bottom left's a blind versus blind, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, bottom right. And, or the bottom right, I mean. Yeah, it's a blind versus blind. And... Uh, this is a spot where if I was going to three bet ace jack and take a four bet against a guy who I know is a light four better, it's not the worst thing in the world to jam ace jack there. You got two big cards, you got some equity, and this guy's already shown that he can four bet. And this is a spot where people like to four bet and play back light and stuff like that. Um, so if I was going to shove any of these, I would shove the bottom right. That said, um, 
I would still probably plan on folding them all, and I would probably plan on stop going for Thin Valley to get called by a worse hand like Ace Jack against this guy, which we talked about already. We said, you know, we already had a similar hand with this guy where we three bet for Thin Value and he four bet us, we had to fold. Mm-hmm. Um, clearly, our plan here is no longer to three bet and expect this guy to call. We've three bet him three or four times now, and he's never called out of position once. Mm-hmm. He's playing by our rules. So. We got a plan for that too, which is we polarize and everything we're three betting for value we're stacking off with, mm-hmm. and uh, other stuff we're three betting as a bluff. Um, the reason why I say I might shut the ace jack is because we might be able to say, well, I'm going to three bet five bet ace jack for thin value, but that's getting pretty thin. So yeah. end of the story, end of the day, I would still probably fold both of them. Okay, so so with a hand, but you said, but any pair is better. So even if I had like five, if fives, you had pocket tens on the bottom left, I would definitely shove it. If I, you had on, any the bottom right? on, the, on the bottom right, I mean, you, I would definitely shove it. Any pair? Even like three? Yeah. Well, if we assume, by the way, that he's probably not going to four bet a hand like pocket eights, mm-hmm. which he may. I mean, I don't know how, how advanced micros have gotten, but probably not. <laughs> um, usually when we play against players, uh, we assume that they're, you know, I want to get aggressive and stack off range. Just usually include like jacks through aces and ace kings, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and against that range, pocket tens and pocket deuces are the same thing, basically. Right, right, right. Um, and so, yeah, if I was going to three bet a pair, I would, I would, sh- would be with the intention of shoving it. Okay. Um, so let's see what you did. It's kind of interesting and fun. I have a bad feeling you shoved the top, top right one. <laughs> so when we do polarize any pairs, I mean, that that's okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. We polarize against people. Okay. Yep. Polarizing is good. So, oh, so we flat there. So once again, flatting is bad for us here. Yeah, because we have no. Because even if we're a fifty-fifty, yeah, you know, which is like a best case scenario for us. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, we, it's not like it's not a situation where a fifty-fifty wins because of position, because position is inherently dependent on stack size. Mhm. Um, i.e., you know, if, like. You know, let's let's use a good example. If I raise pocket deuces and you three bit me with an ace king, right? Like, if I call and try to flop a set, like or whatever, you're gonna, you know, basically beat me if we have a hundred big blinds remaining. But if your three bit puts me all in, I win. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Even though you're in position pre-flop, really cool. I'm all in with my deuces, and now we're now I'm a slight favorite. <laughs> um, and th- it's important to to distinguish between those those that, those two different ideas based off stack sizes. Okay. Um, but that's actually probably going to do it for today. Um, unless there's like another significant hand you want me to see? Uh, no. I don't I think that's so I think we're going to pick up this video for next week also. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll continue this the barrage <laughs> of four betting. Um, but remember that these are all different people. I know. <laughs> like it's not like it's not like there's like one guy playing on on twenty accounts. <laughs> it's just like trying trying to make your life hell right now. It's, yeah, they're it's... all conspiring against me. <laughs> exactly. They're not they're not all on like some you know IRC chat room being like, yeah, it's fucking Christy chick. Like <laughs> I'm gonna four better now. Yeah, and then your turn now, dude. And like it's not happening. Yeah. Like it's just it's just a lot of people individually picking up hands. Maybe there's a chance that one of them is either bad aggressive or good aggressive, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we don't get to know those things unless we have further evidence. Mm-hmm. Now, this guy on the bottom right, this Po Crespo, starting to show decent evidence that he is a good aggressive player, mm-hmm. right? Full stacking, playing aggressively pre-flop, like good race sizes. His format, his format size is a little bit big, but not too bad. You know, he... You know, clearly has you know at least some grasp of the game, and so when we're gonna three bet him, we get a polarize, which means that anything for value we stack off. Okay. Anything that's that we can't three bet for value and stack off with, we call. Mm-hmm. And anything that we can't call with, we can three bet as a bluff. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I hope everybody <laughs> enjoyed my pain, but it's good because <laughs> I I know a lot of people. Are you know go through the same thing and and will kind of yeah everyone has and everyone always will forever deal with the the process of basically being owned by everyone at the table at the same time. <laughs> and, and the other thing the other thing you were talking about is getting better by by writing your thoughts and 
Mm-hmm. Um, that's the other thing I wanted to mention is that I'm going to c- keep a, a blog on Deuces Cracked and forward slash Snapdress, I think. I haven't put anything up. Well, by the time this airs, actually, there will be stuff up. And I'm going to cool. just kind of talk about, you know, the things I'm learning, my path, and, and how it's how it's been going. So Definitely. You guys should all should all make sure to check that out. It occurs to me, by the way, before we sign off, that there's one more theory thing that I need to go over. Okay. So, sorry for stealing the thunder from your blog. No, no, no. no, no, no. I, I just wanted to... Yeah, for sure. It was good advice, and I just want to mention that. I forgot, I forgot to mention that before. Um, well, the last thing I wanted to say was this idea of the, the ace-queen hand where we called out a position. All right? So, the reason why we never call out a position is like basically what we said, which is that if we're 50-50 and there's like some money behind, and there's enough money in a three-bet pot situation to make position you know, work, um, a 50-50, the guy wins. So if we raise pocket tens and the guy three bets, three bets with King Jack, you know, he's going to win, even though tens is a better hand, quote unquote, than King Jack. The fact that we're 50-50, there's money behind and he, and, uh, and he's got 50% equity means he's going to win. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we don't, we don't tend to call out a position because of that. However, when good players know that's our plan, they change their three betting. They stop three betting king king jack because they can't get value anymore. They start calling and they start three betting stuff like seven six suited, mm-hmm. right? Which makes sense. It's one of those things where we're saying, oh well, if we can't call with it, then we can raise it as a bluff. And maybe he thought he couldn't call with seven six there because of a variety of reasons. That's probably fine. Um, okay, cool. Um, sorry about the technical difficulty. Uh, just to finish my thought, so when a good player knows that we are we're three betting or that that we're playing uh, four four better fold against their three bets, they'll polarize their range, which they should. Um, and if they're polarized, that means that their bluffs are so bad, usually so bad, that like if we have a hand like Ace Queen, our equity will be so dominating that we actually can – we have enough of an advantage that we might be able to say we could make more money from calling and playing out of position than we could from uh, from re-raising. Now, that's difficult to say for sure because let's say that we've got 70% equity to their 30. That's clearly enough that we could we should, we should would want to play it out of position. Um, but uh, – you know, because they have position, maybe our profit might only be like, I don't know, maybe our actual true equity value. Is, I'm just pulling numbers uh, out of nothing right now. But let's say they might be like, you know, 55, 45, which is still good for us. Um, you know, do we ha- do we get more money? Do we get cleaner money by, let's say, four betting ace queen and calling a shove? Because we probably do have to call a shove uh, given how much money's in the pot at that point. Um, and it's sort of a difficult question, which depends on how bad the hands your opponent is three betting you with are. Um, and it depends on um, on how likely he is to call you with a worse hand or stack up with a worse hand if you four bet. You know, mm-hmm. if you four bet and he stacks off with ace jack, then four betting is clearly better with ace queen. But if you uh, if you four bet, he folds all those. But he's also three betting you with a ten deuce offsuit. Then clearly calling with a with uh, out of position with ace queen is better. Um, and so that's just something to think about. Um, so all you who have sort of followed the never call a three bet out of position camp, this applies against players who are generally passive or generally bad. It's just a good thing not to do. Um, against players who are aggressive bad, who are three betting you with really, really, really weak hands, calling actually might start to become a better option than four betting with good hands, with really good hands. Um, four bet bluffing obviously still works against these players as well. Okay. Any questions? No. <laughs> Cool. That'll do it for uh, this episode of Coach and Christy. Um, for DeuceCrack.com, it's been Andrew Beluga Whale Sideman. And, and Christy. <laughs> and Christy, the Ninja Dolphin Arnett. Hey, I wasn't um, going to say it, but now I guess it's cool. To say it now. <laughs> um, yeah, and hope you guys enjoyed the video, and we'll see you guys next week. Good luck.